Well, I mean, how could I resist the, uh, the invitation? It's a lovely spring day, and to come and talk to uh, 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 parents of uh, UCC boys, what a wonderful uh, uh, invitation. Thank you so much for asking me. It is, however, a slightly disorienting experience. Well, slightly is an exaggeration, under-exaggeration, it is a very disorienting experience because I realize as I'm uh, driving up here, coming up here, that our 45th reunion is, is coming this fall from, uh, from my friends uh, in our class and will certainly uh, be there. And then as I'm going to the washroom upstairs, I see a Pendrith in front of me. Now, this, this Pendrith, I say, that's not Sheila. And I asked, and of course, Randy Pendrith, who was my friend all the way through school, that's his daughter-in-law. I can't believe it. Uh, and then I end up at the top of the stairs, and who do I see but Susan Beck. I mean, oh my god, Susan and I used to hang out all the time during high school. So, uh, you know, all these uh, memories and experiences are uh, flooding back. Uh, but I do want to say I had a wonderful time at, uh, at UCC. I started in junior form with Miss Milson. This is ancient history. The <laughs> upper school, that was the first year of the new upper school. They had just torn down the old one and built it. Reverend Sovey was the principal uh, at the time. Alan Stephen was the principal in the prep school. Uh, and I went all the way through to um, grade 13. And uh, the friends I made there, I kept all the way along, uh, and I still see them, and we, uh, we hang out together, and it's a great experience. And I did have a great educational experience there. So this is uh, one of the ways I'm giving back, and I hope to be able to continue to give back to UCC in many other ways uh, as well. So really, it is a pleasure for me to come and, uh, and talk. So, the title is slightly alarmist, <laughs> but I think it's true. Um, uh, I think there is a crisis in child and youth mental health in this country. Not only this country actually, but I think worldwide. I want to talk a little bit about what and how we understand uh, mental health or addiction challenge. I want to talk a little bit about how often mental health is at risk for children and youth. I want to talk about how important mental health in childhood and adolescence is for healthy adulthood. I want to talk quickly about some of the factors that influence the mental health of children and youth, how we think about different interventions, and then, for those of you who need the system, uh, and, and that may be unfortunate, but many people do need the system, a few tips on how to navigate the system. So really, uh, think of a, a mental health addiction challenge as a difficulty in emotional and behavioral regulation. So the ability that we all have uh, to regulate emotions and behaviors in response to a stressful situation is an important developmental achievement. And when stress overcomes the ability to regulate that stress, then a disorder, a child psychiatric disorder, occurs. But remember, it's important to realize that all the behaviors that are part of a child psychiatric disorder are also present in um, normal and typical behavior. So for example, stealing and lying is something that you see in kids with a conduct disorder, a child psychiatric disorder. But amongst the males in the room, for example, how many as kids lied and stole on occasion? <laughs> okay, so we get the point. If I were to, if I were to ask, okay, a couple of girls do it. <laughs> even more strongly, that this is a continuum of behaviors and the border between what's sort of typical and what we might think of as a disorder is in fact a fuzzy border. There are different types of stresses that kids experience. Parent-child conflict is probably the most important form of stress. Marital conflict, even not involving the child. Parental, mental health and addiction challenges is an important stress for kids as well. Problems at school, conflict with teachers, it does occur, maybe not at UCC. Maybe when I was going to UCC, 
I had a little bit of conflict with one or two teachers, but I won't <laughs> delve with that. Uh, problems with peers, I think bullying is becoming more of a stress for kids. And then major life events like moving, uh, bereavement, those kinds of things, all these are actually important forms and common forms of stress for kids, and it affects the brain. So you can't really think that there's environment and there's brain, uh, you know, that, uh, but that these two factors really interact to a significant extent. So stress changes the brain. It changes the way the connections are formulated in the brain. Stress hormones that are released through the hypothalamus and what we call the HPA axis actually changes the structure and function of the brain. And small bits of stress are good. Now, this is a point that I want to emphasize is that we need to think about not only disorder and mental health challenges, but we need to think about resiliency. And one of the most important pathways to resiliency among kids is through stress, as long as the stress is short term, and as long as there's an adult figure, a parent, a teacher, a coach, who can buffer that stress at the same time. It's chronic stress that really overcomes kids' ability, uh, even kids who have who have uh, innate and inborn genetic resiliency, but it's chronic stress that will overcome that resiliency and then lead to problems of one sort or another. So this balance between the stress that's experienced and the resiliency of the child, that's really what causes a child psychiatric disorder. And there is variation in the amount of stress that kids experience, and that variation changes over time through infancy, early childhood, adolescence, even young adulthood. There's also variation in resiliency. So in that, and, and resiliency to a certain extent is inborn. There's an important genetic familial component to resiliency as well. So resiliency is affected by physical health, by genetics, by families, by peers, and by schools. And the relationship between, as I say, resiliency and stress can change over time and look very different. We need to think of kids as nested within different environments. So kids are nested within the family and their peers, and families and peers are nested within schools and neighborhoods, and that's nested within communities and social systems, and that's nested within an entire uh, nation, country, or province. So a common question that I get asked uh, very frequently is how do you tell if an emotional behavioral dysregulation is part of a disorder, or if there's something really wrong that requires attention, or whether it's part of normal development and typical ups and downs. So one uh, way of telling is whether a behavior is developmentally inappropriate. So for example, anxiety about separation is appropriate when you're four and five years of age, but anxiety about separation from your parents when you're 13 or 14 years of age is developmentally inappropriate. So the same behavior that occurs in two developmental stages is an important uh, rule by which you can tell the difference. Severity, frequency, and duration are atypical. So everybody can lie once, Don. Everybody can steal once. That's okay. It's when you do it frequently and chronically. You know, th over a three-month period, for example, uh, you know, of being anxious. Being depressed over a two-week period is a significant problem. So each behavior has its own criteria for duration, but everybody's allowed transient ups and downs. The most important criterion, though, is whether a symptom or behavior impairs functioning. So if there's difficulty, if the behavior interferes with the kid's ability to function at school, if grades are going down, to get along with parents, more with, if there's withdrawal from peers, an inability to participate in community activities. It's impairment that's really important in differentiating the transient ups and downs of development from a mental health 
disorder or a mental health addiction challenge. So some early warning signs uh, that you might find helpful. Uh, any change in functioning then that really lasts more than a month is a warning sign that something needs to be done. <coughs> Irritability. Irritability with family and peers is a non-specific sign that kids will demonstrate that they're under a lot of stress uh, and that something needs to be paid attention to. Withdrawal from family and peers, a deterioration in school performance, a change in sleep is really important. Sleep is such a sensitive indicator of mental health that it's one of the things that uh, uh, we as parents really need to keep on top of is whether our kids are sleeping well, uh, uh, you know, going to bed and getting a good night's sleep because once stress starts to overcome the system, one of the first things that gets disrupted is the ability to have a good sleep. And then any kind of communication challenges. And I, one of the things I'm going to emphasize, that whatever happens to the, your relationship with your kids, the most important thing uh, that you uh, need to pay attention to is keeping those lines of communication <coughs> open. I brought my daughter with me for lunch today. <laughs> And I hope she will swear that through all the ups and downs of our conflict over the years, we did keep our lines of communication open. Didn't we? Don't say anything. <laughs> I just go on to share with you sort of what our thinking is these days about different types of mental health and addiction challenges. So we've got really four types of disorder. We have what are called internalizing disorder, anxiety and mood disorders. We've got externalizing disorders, attention deficit disorder, oppositional disorder, that's what Josie had. <laughs> 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 developmental disorders like autism, spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, learning disabilities, and then addictions, alcohol, smoking, marijuana, other types of, uh, of drugs. So, I'm going to give you some, uh, some statistics. How common do you think mental health and addiction disorders are among children and youth? Come up with a figure in your own mind. The actual data are that about at any one point in time, the prevalence of any psychiatric disorder among children and youth is 20%. So that's across, across the general population, one in five kids will have, at any one point in time, will have a significant mental health or addiction challenge. It's a lot of kids. Now if we add to that, the criterion of severe impairment, so not just a little bit of impairment, but severe impairment, the prevalence rate, come up with a figure of what you think of a mental health and addiction of psychiatric disorder in kids with severe impairment, and the figure is 12%. So 12% of kids at any one point in time have a significant mental health problem plus severe and chronic impairment. Chronically not able to do well at school, chronically not able to uh, participate in community activities, to get along with family and friends. And then let's ask, of those who have a disorder, what percentage are actually able to get specialist mental health services for their problem? So 16% in Ontario. So 16% of kids with a problem are able to get mental health services in Ontario. In the United States, it's not a lot better. It's about 20%, and that's more uh, recent data from 2010. So what we're able to provide is nowhere near what we're able to address, what we need to address at that point in time, and that's why I uh, uh, feel strongly that there is, in fact, a crisis in mental health for kids in this country. So that was the prevalence at one point in time. Now, what about the prevalence over childhood and adolescence? So 
by the time kids graduate from high school, roughly 35% will have experienced a mental health or addiction problem during that developmental period. So now one in three kids over the course of their childhood and adolescence will have experienced a mental health disorder. 10% of kids have a learning disability in math, spelling, or reading. 20% of kids in Ontario are not ready for senior kindergarten. Now, I wasn't ready for senior kindergarten because I tried to get in to the prep school uh, for one year, and Al and Stephen asked me to throw a ball and kick a ball, and whether I was right and left-handed. So he determined I wasn't ready for that year, which is good because it would have been my 46th reunion. <laughs> it had to be a problem, so I'm glad he, he kept me back a year. But no, to be serious, this is a, this is a serious problem that 20% of kids in Ontario senior kindergarten are not ready for the cognitive and social emotional demands of senior kindergarten. And that's not, uh, this is a statistic that's actually replicated all across Canada, not just in, in Ontario. There's important sex differences, and I bring this up because of your special interest in, in boys. So boys are certainly at risk for uh, developmental disorders. So uh, learning disabilities, boys have about four times the rate of learning disabilities, autism spectrum disorders, developmental coordination disorders than girls to do. So the sex ratio is about four to one. In uh, prepubertal children, the rate of anxiety and depression is about equal in boys and girls. And then with the onset of puberty, girls become much greater, much more at risk for anxiety and mood disorders. So the rate of anxiety and mood disorders among girls really starts to escalate post-puberty. And we don't really know why uh, that, mi that might be. So this important message is, is that vulnerability really varies with sex and with developmental stage. And this is a this is a, a, a chart uh, that sort of um, outlines the different age of onset for psychiatric disorders in the general population. And the darkest area is the greatest age of onset, but the outlines of the, if I do this, yes, you can see it. So, mm -hmm. so for example, attention deficit disorder, you know, has an age of onset on average between five years of age and 12 years of age. Not an age of onset, but it extends between five and 10, 12, 15 years of age. <clears throat> anxiety disorders, age of onset six or seven, it, but anxiety disorders can onset in adolescence as well. So the main point I wanna make about this slide is that there's two periods of real vulnerability. One is in infancy, Zero to six is what we call an infancy. The other period of vulnerability is early adolescence. So 10, 11, 12, 13 years of age is a real period of vulnerability for the development of anxiety and mood disorders among both boys and girls. So if boys are gonna get it, uh, it often will onset at that 10, 12, 11, 13 uh, uh, developmental uh, timetable and uh, a window. And that period of vulnerability is because the brain is maturing really quickly at that time period. The prefrontal cortex, so the front part of your brain, where you do a lot of your cognitive thinking, is developing really quickly at that time. And uh, as you go through adolescence, the ability of that part of your brain to control your impulses and your bad thoughts and things that come from deeper parts of your brain become better and better. So the vulnerability period is also the time where there's greater plasticity and more opportunity for early intervention and doing things. So we know the earlier you intervene, the better the chances for outcomes are. So one of the messages I want to give is that for boys, that preteen, early adolescence time period is a, is a very important point at which to be developmentally sensitive to mental health challenges, particularly anxiety uh, and uh, mood disorders. 
Now, not only should we be doing uh, providing more services for these kids, but it's an economic argument. The economy depends on our uh, ability to uh, provide adequate services to uh, children and youth with mental health problems. So the estimates are that each year a family will lose $10,000 in income as a result of their child's mental health or addiction challenge. That comes from their own lost productivity at work, but also because of the, if they go for help and services, the, uh, the extent to which uh, that will cost the family in one way or another. We don't have, really, as, as I'm sure many of you appreciate, uh, have a, that great a social safety net. Uh, we don't really have free medical, we don't, certainly don't have free mental health services for children in this province or this country. We have data from the United States that suggests the total annual cost to the American economy for mental health and addiction problems in kids is over two trillion dollars. So that is an enormous uh, expenditure in lost income as a result of mental health and addiction challenges in kids. So not only is it the right thing for us to be doing, but it makes economic sense for us to be doing it as well. It's also becoming much more sensitive and aware of the importance of mental health during childhood and adolescence and adult outcomes. So adolescents that have a mental health disorder are at risk as adults of increased stress, worse residential uh, status, worse uh, educational status, so not completing high school, not completing secondary school, college, etc. Lower occupational status as adults. Kids with a mental health condition lose 10 years on average of their life uh, because of associated medical comorbidities. If an adult has a mental health problem, for 50% of those adults, the disorder has its onset during childhood or adolescence. So really, the, the only mental health uh, period that's not related to childhood or adolescence is mental health problems in the senior years. I'm a shining example. Uh, uh, so the geriatric mental health problems are not related to childhood, but all the way up, 20s, 30s, 40s, and even 50s, if folks have a mental health challenge, it will have started in some way. It may not be the same disorder, but something will have started in childhood or adolescence. And suicide, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, suicide is a real problem in this country. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young adults. Canada does not have a national suicide prevention plan. Many other developed countries uh, and low-income countries have a national suicide prevention plan. Canada doesn't. And that suicide, particularly among our Aboriginal youth, is, I think, a, a national crisis and a, a national shame. We're also becoming aware of the uh, important link between mental health disorders in kids and adult physical health outcomes. So for example, kids with a mental health or addiction disorder are at increased risk of adult obesity and cardiovascular disease. So there's this unusual uh, relationship. We don't really understand what it is between early depression, for example, and later angina, high blood pressure, diabetes, <coughs> atherosclerosis. Kids who are smoking are certainly at increased risk of all kinds of substance use problems as uh, adults. I'm glad Mr. Johnson caught me smoking uh, out on Slybrook Road uh, that time. I didn't know that. And uh, kids that have sort of functional somatic complaints are become adults with functional somatic complaints, and that costs the adult medical system an enormous amount of money uh, in uh, unwarranted and unneeded medical investigations. What is somatic complaints? Sorry? Go ahead. Somatic body. So these are kids with tummy aches, oh, headaches. Yes. yes, please interrupt me if I use jargon that you that you don't you don't understand. I, I, I try not to, but uh, sometimes it, it slips in. This is an important slide. It was it's the data from the World Health Organization and what they call sort of the global burden of disease. And what they've looked at is 
when we look at disability and morbidity, so illness and ill health and the disability that's associated with that, how much do the different disorders and diseases contribute to overall ill health, disability, loss of functioning over the lifespan? And so the World Health Organization, and they've apportioned the total amount of disability to different types of disorders. And I'll just point out, for example, that uh, mental health disorders account for 17% of all the disability up to 70 years of age. That's more than cardiovascular disease, that's more than cancer, that's more than injuries, that's more than neurological conditions, that's more than, than respiratory conditions. So, mental health disorders account for the largest proportion of disability and impairment across the entire lifespan. And I'll ask you, how much do we, or our resources, do we put into mental health compared to the other medical conditions? Not that they aren't equally important, but there ought to be at least some equity when it comes to the proportion of resources we put into mental health. So why is there a crisis? I think maybe uh, I, uh, I've uh, I pointed out and shared with you that I think the magnitude of the problem outstrips the resources we have. Kids make up 20% of the population. They consume much less than their share of health care resources. And of mental health care resources is a fraction of health care resources for kids. It's true to say that the resources we do have we don't use efficiently. And Canada ranks very poorly on the international scales when it comes to different measures of child health. We're somewhere in the middle. We're better than the Americans. We're better than the United Kingdom. But we're much worse than the Scandinavian countries and other countries in Europe like, uh, like Holland, uh, the Netherlands, France, and Germany, for example. Tips. How can I avoid giving you tips uh, 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 to avoid mental health issues uh, in your in, in your own kids? Uh, so um, I don't want you to tell people whether I did these things or not. Like it's not something yeah. I'm down. This is not a scorecard. <laughs> So, but I'm just thinking about the kinds of things that I tell parents if a child is vulnerable, if they're going through a very stressful period, and all kids go through stress, and they should go through stress. That's my earlier point about building resiliency. Stress is important, uh, but there needs to be a buffer from another adult. So avoiding conflict is so important. Uh, uh, but feel free to express disapproval. There's a difference between conflict and expressing disapproval. You can express disapproval in a non-conflictual way. And that becomes really important, particularly for uh, adolescents. And there's a difference between being authoritative and authoritarian. So you need to be strong, you need to be consistent, but you can't be a dictator. You have to be able to negotiate, you have to be able uh, to talk. You need to be vigilant. So you need to know what your kids are doing, right? And I think today, certainly compared to my parents, parents are less vigilant knowing what they're doing because they're not paying as much attention to their kids uh, because they're, you know, they're texting as much as the kids are over the dinner table. So it's really important to put the text machine, you know, the, the phones away at the dinner table and find out what your kids are doing uh, and, 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 uh, and just monitor uh, uh, where they're going, who they're hanging out with, and so forth. Have your lines in the sand, uh, but have a lot of negotiation room within that particular circle. So kids need to know what's uh, acceptable, what's not acceptable, but that should be a broad circle and a lot of room for negotiation within that. So important to teach your kids negotiation skills for themselves as adults, and the only way they're going to learn that is by modeling from your own negotiation skills with them. Increased privileges, really important. Increased responsibilities with age, 
really important. Uh, but generally, punishments don't work. Uh, certainly, corporal punishment does not work at all. It's a serious uh, mental health, a serious trauma that does lead to significant mental health problems. There's no doubt about that. But other sorts of punishments don't work, but a brief <coughs> loss of privileges and a delay of rewards do. And I'm all in favor of bribery. <laughs> <laughs> bribery is a very effective parenting strategy uh, uh, as long as you get your desired outcome. If you don't get your desired outcome, then the reward doesn't occur as a result of that. There is nothing wrong with bribery. I'm also going to emphasize skill development. Skill development is a really important aspect of resiliency. So we know that there's some kids who live in terrible psychosocial circumstances of one sort or another. They've experienced a lot of trauma, they've experienced abuse, terrible life changes. But you know, only a minority of kids actually still develop a disorder in the context of those risk factors. So when we look and have done research into what is it that protects those kids, what we often find is skill development, that those kids have a particular skill, an extracurricular hobby, they're good at sports, they've developed a relationship with a coach, they've developed a relationship with a teacher, they're really good at art, uh, etc. Those things become really, really important. Being able to manage one's impulses, to improve one's self-control, uh, is, uh, is a key factor in, in, uh, in protecting against uh, traumatic events. Kids who are able to challenge unreasonable thoughts do much better in the face of adversity than other kids that have more difficulty challenging uh, unreasonable thoughts. Reducing stress, having distractions, things that you enjoy doing, that's all fine. Relaxing, exercise is so important. We're becoming more and more aware of uh, the, uh, the mood enhancing effects, the relaxation, effects of regular exercise, cardiovascular exercise in particular, and again, I can't overemphasize the importance of good uh, sleep hygiene. What kind of mental health interventions do we have? So by and large, we focus on reducing stress and increasing resilience uh, amongst using some of the factors that I outlined in the previous uh, level, uh, in the previous slide. <coughs> We can pro provide these interventions at the level of the family, the community. You can have school-wide interventions. So bullying interventions, anti-bullying programs that cover an entire school are in fact very effective and protect vulnerable kids to the impact of that uh, of bullying. And anything that affects parent-child relationships is going to have a big impact on the health of children and youth. So here's some tips about how to navigate the system if you have any concerns about your kids. So I think the best place to start is always with primary care. Starting with the family doctor is a good place to start because he or she uh, will have knowledge about how to tell the difference between the typical ups and downs and what is a red flag. They may not be great at diagnosing it, but they're good at identifying red flags and they'll have some view of uh, where to access mental health services. Uh, education has an important role to play in mental health and having a discussion with the school counselor, uh, you know, with a guidance counselor, with the school nurse, with the school social worker, sorry Susan, you're gonna get more work uh, as a result of this, I think is very important. Ontario has a very sophisticated landscape of community mental health agencies more so than the other provinces, and certainly more so than they do in the United States. And the personnel in many of these community mental health agencies are very talented, they're very highly trained, uh, and they're able to manage a large bulk of the mental health problems within the community. Similarly, there are uh, outpatient services at some hospitals, not all hospitals in the city in Toronto, for example, do have child and adolescent mental health services, but many of them do. Um, and many of them have, most of the psychiatrists in the city uh, work at one of the different hospitals. 
I think one of the problems in the system is that people prefer to go to see the child and adolescent psychiatrist too early in the trajectory of the problem. And I think the psychiatrists, we need to be there for the really complex, severe cases, but where it's more primary, secondary mental health care, that can be dealt with by the school, by primary care, and by many of these community mental health agencies. So I would recommend starting there and then moving into the child psychiatry system later in the, in the trajectory. And then I'm always going to emphasize the importance of multidisciplinary teams. Private practice is not a good place for chronic mental health care. Uh, the best place to get the highest quality health care for your kids is in a team-based approach where, it is a, where there's a multidisciplinary team, including occupational therapists. My daughter's an occupational therapist. <laughs> I, know, I know there are long wait lists. Uh, it's a real problem. I know the system is fragmented. I know it works in isolation. The problem is, is that the the ministry is man the government is mandated different ministries to look after kids, education, health, social services. You know, everybody's got their own piece of the pie, <coughs> and people aren't really working together. And we do have evidence-based interventions, but these are not uh, consistently uh, consistently implemented. So how can you tell if you're getting a good service uh, from a mental health professional? Uh, so here's some tips. Uh, one thing is to uh, make sure that information is collected not only from you as a parent, but that the kid is interviewed, regardless of how old the kid is. Even an infant, two, three, four-year-old should be played with as part of the assessment, and a third party. So information from the teacher is so essential in providing a comprehensive assessment. Using a mixture of assessment tools, ask the person who's coming up with a treatment plan, is this based on a DSM-5 diagnosis? Ask what's the evidence that this treatment plan works, because people will give you a treatment plan that's not evidence-based. Uh, and make sure it's a shared decision-making process. Don't accept a treatment plan that you haven't been involved with in discussing the pros and cons. It should always be a shared decision making, not something that you accept in, a, uh, in, a, in, in that kind of a manner. And all interventions have benefits, all interventions have risks, all interventions have costs, and you should be aware of what the benefits and the costs and the risks are, and is the, do the benefits outweigh the risks in your particular uh, situation. Can I just ask? Yeah, DSM-5. Okay. So DSM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. So that contains the diagnoses that we use. Uh, so people use terms that aren't diagnostic labels in DSM-5. Things like, for example, sensory integration disorder. That's not a qualified diagnosis, right? But a mood disorder is, or an anxiety disorder, that's in DSM-5. So you, people, are, you people uh, some professionals use terms which they convey has a diagnostic meaning, but actually are labels for symptoms or traits, but don't qualify as a disorder. So how to navigate the system? So really relying on the family doctor and, and or the pediatrician, because they're the individual that provides you with the continuity of care. Children's Mental Health Ontario is a great website to look at if you're looking for mental health uh, resources. Many of the hospitals, as I say, in Toronto, uh, do have uh, uh, very good mental health services. Uh, be very careful about the internet. There is a lot of poor, uh, information on the internet, uh, so rely on what you feel comfortable with as a reputable source of information. Sick Kids, for example, I work there, uh, does have a very good um, uh, website and contains a lot of good mental health information. And always ask, how good is the evidence for this? If somebody makes a recommendation, 
how good is the evidence? Is this based on good, solid clinical trial evidence in terms of what you're proposing? Um, there are significant changes coming to the mental health system in uh, the province of Ontario. And the Ministry of Ch Children and Youth uh, have developed a strategic plan called Moving on Mental Health. And instead of there being over 60 children mental health age, child and youth mental health agencies in the city of Toronto, but currently think about that for a moment, there are more than 60 children and youth mental health agencies in the city of Toronto. With this new strategic plan, there will be only one agency, a lead agency, and they will contract out services to the other 59. So this is a radical change in the way mental health services are being delivered to uh, kids. That will provide a single point of access. So you won't have to be phoning 60 different places to get services. You only have to phone one number. And core services, that is essential mental health services, will be defined, and they're all going to be accountable to the lead agency. Currently, mental health agencies in Toronto can do whatever interventions they want to do. They don't have to be evidence-based, and they're not accountable to anybody except their board. Some of them do fabulous work. Others aren't really providing core services that are evidence-based. And I think uh, we're all really looking forward to uh, the implementation of this strategic plan in the lead agency. <clears throat> so remember, even though kids are 20% of the population, they are 100% of our future. And we, although we love them dearly and we work really hard with them, parents and teachers and primary care physicians often miss early problems. We catch them much too late in their trajectory. And since uh, early intervention is important, if you're concerned, it's really important to be persistent in terms of getting help. All kids differ in their natural abilities. Uh, uh, and so no, no two kids are ever the same. The, the playing field is not level for all kids. You don't have to be the best. I certainly wasn't. You just have to be good enough. And I like to say good enough is actually good enough. And that failure is good, mm -hmm. sometimes. <laughs> and as my uh, mentor uh, used to say, and, he, and he, he told it to Yogi Berra, so it really came from my mentor, <laughs> when Yogi Berra, but it ain't over till it's over. And kids have their own developmental timetable. And success often comes after high school. So success doesn't have to occur in high school. Uh, and I think we know that success often occurs in young adulthood and even into your 30s. And I think, uh, uh, I think that's an important message for all of us to keep, uh, uh, to keep on top of. So thank you very much. I'll stop there. So, um, uh, a place, a quiet place, a place where there's a, an opportunity for, uh, you know, mindfulness, for example. So, relaxation training, doing yoga, for example, that's a great, uh, you know, thing for wellness. Uh, advice about nutrition, eating well, sleep hygiene, how to handle the computer at home, you know, information about the computer, how to handle the internet. Those kinds of things. Having all that in one particular space is a, is a great idea. And uh, you know, uh, those skills, particularly in, in mindfulness, which we, what we mean by that is just being able to focus and keep away stressful things out of your consciousness and relax, is a very important skill. And uh, I, certainly, I certainly never learned it, uh, but it is a very important <laughs> skill to have. It can be really useful for kids. But a neat idea. Our wellness center, I can't do this. Our wellness, we used to have on the third floor a little music room. 
And so uh, four or five of us would always go to this music room and listen to records during free time or whatever. So that was our wellness center. It was great. I really loved it. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Okay. I have a comparative question. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether the world today is much different than it was many years ago. And I'm, I'm remembering from your statistics the 20% and the 10%. Yep. And, and how, it, because I think you were saying that those are very recent statistics. So I'm just trying to get an idea of how that compares to when we were growing up, for instance. Right, so, so actually 20% comes from data 1983 to 1987. Um, and uh, it's based on what's called the Ontario Child Health Study, which I was fortunate to be involved in, where we did a population-based survey. Now, uh, so that one in five comes from that study. I'm very excited because we're repeating the Ontario Child Health Study. And actually, we're out in the field as we speak now, collecting data on kids today. So this will be, once we publish these data, this will be the only study that has taken the same measurement tools 30 years apart to really see whether there's been a change. So, but other places have looked at this in a little bit of detail. There's no question that, um, that things have changed dramatically. So the concept of a family has changed dramatically. The economy has changed dramatically. So there are all kinds of things that suggest uh, you know, the situation has gotten worse today than it was 20, 30 years ago. You can see hospital statistics for kids being admitted, admitted to hospitals for mental health reasons going up dramatically as of 2008, 2009. So when the economy tanked, kids started being admitted to hospitals. Uh, at an alarming rate. So it's going to be really interesting to see whether that 20% is higher today or whether uh, it's stable and that there are other factors that are just making kids less resilient in the face of those mental health challenges. Express disapproval, but I missed the second part. Just um, if you could also comment on how both kind of practical comments might have around that practical Okay. Yeah. So, so what I mean by conflict is yelling and screaming and shouting. Mm -hmm. So high expressed emotion. Some and some really uh, good studies showing that high expressed emotion in the family uh, is a recipe for disaster, frankly. A lot of shouting, screaming, and yelling as a way of expressing, you know, disapproval about a behavior is, uh, uh, will just lead to, will just cascade into all kinds of problems. So expressing disapproval in a calm, supportive, disciplined kind of way, you know, is very important. So you need to give it with a straight face you have to, I'm really disappointed. This was totally inappropriate. It's, you know, outrageous. But to do that without getting angry is the key. respond immediately, walk away from the situation, practice with your partner, your spouse, you know, go away, practice what you're going to say, have it in your mind, right, and then come back, when everybody's calmed down, then come back, okay, we have to have a conversation, let's sit down, let's talk about this, and then do it that way. But don't be impulsive, don't, don't, uh, don't do it at that, at that moment. Now, my good friend and colleague, 
uh, Dr. Sunita Manga is here. Sunita works with me at SickKids, one of the, one of my favorite people to work with. Sunita, am I am I all crazy or am I okay? Am I right? You're dead on. Dead on. Okay. Thank you. Question. You were talking about the fact that 50% of adults' mental health issues manifest themselves when um, they're children. And then you talked also about the, the need and the importance of early intervention in children with mental health issues. Can you speak a bit about the statistics of if we do that, if we do intervene early with our children, where there are issues, what are the long-term ramifications of that in terms of their adult mental health? Yeah, so maybe not everybody heard this, but uh, I've emphasized the importance of, of early intervention and what's the actual evidence that early intervention makes a difference. The most interesting, there's se several different types of early intervention. I'm going to talk about Head Start. So I don't know if you know Head Start, but Head Start was an enriched kindergarten program that was developed in the United States. Uh, it was for uh, kids who were living in poverty or highly disadvantaged environments. And they had, it was a true experiment, so they randomized some kids to participate in Head Start, and then another group of kids just was whatever they would do normally under normal circumstances. And then, so kids, and uh, the Head Start program, all it was was educational enrichment with a teacher. So the kind of, you know, kindergarten I got uh, would have been provided for kids who were living in real disadvantage. And the, the story behind the kids with Head Start was is that they did much better in the early school years than their peers who didn't get it. Then the differences wiped out in the later school years. But actually, they graduated from high school at a, at a higher rate. They went on to university at a higher rate. They engaged in less criminal behavior. They had less hypertension, fewer strokes, less obesity, less cardiovascular disease. So here's, a, here's an enriched intervention that focused on early learning environment that had an impact not only on their learning, but on their physical health. It's, it's absolutely amazing. So I think that really is one of the most powerful examples of how early intervention not only makes a difference for what the target was, the target, uh, behavior, but also for other aspects of health. It's like there's a cascading effect into other aspects of health if you provide it early and it's intensive when you do it. And I think there are other examples about where we can do early intervention in schools, for example. Great studies from Australia providing wellness and anxiety management for the entire school and what a difference that can make to all kids in the school, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of rates of symptoms and behaviors later on. And so the question was whether the whether social media has had a large impact on on mental health. Yeah, I, I think it certainly has. I think the, the concept of cyberbullying is a real problem. So it's taken, and we've always had bullying. It's always been there. When I went to school, it was there. It just now has another outlet, and it's more difficult to manage because it is over the internet. So uh, I think that's had a problem, but that's an issue. I think it's also an issue because um, there's so much stuff on the internet uh, that's unhealthy, you know, like I really think violent video games, there's been demonstrations now, we're pretty sure that violent video games foster and encourage uh, uh, poor problem solving and conflict resolution uh, skills for kids, uh, that it takes them away from reading, takes them away from social interactions that can be more beneficial for them. So certainly, you know, another bits of advice I can give you is, Make sure the computer is not in the bedroom, uh, that it's in a public place in the house. They can't do that. I mean, the kids go to a school where they have their computer while well, doing homework. Yeah, I understand. They're on 24 hours. I understand. But at least if you can take it out of the bedroom, uh, that's one. 
Yeah. Well, I would, I would try and get them out of the bedroom when they're when they're doing it, so that at least they're on the internet in a public place. After all, you're paying for it, right? You're paying for it, so you can you can write the you can draw the circle. That's the line in the sand. I'm paying for it, so you're going to do it in a public place where we can all be together. You haven't commented on marijuana use and marijuana legalization. And we have a generation of young people who think it's just down. Yeah. Right. So, that's, uh, so the question was about marijuana use and, and legalization. Um, so um, so to, to put it this way, um, I don't think we really understand the relationship between uh, marijuana use and, and mental health. There's no question that some kids will resort to marijuana because they have anxiety or a mood disorder. In other words, it's being used as a, an antidepressant, as an anti-anxiety agent. No question about that. What we don't know is whether chronic uh, uh, use leads to other mental health problems. And the reason we can't figure that out is because kids who chronically use marijuana, virtually all of them have a mental health problem anyway. So it's very difficult to sort it out. It does look like chronic marijuana use will lower IQ levels, will lower verbal IQ levels. So that I think we're confident about. But when it comes to the mental health part, we don't know. So chronic marijuana use is a health problem. And because it's a health problem, I don't think it should be criminalized. So I agree with the with the position that it should be uh, it, it uh, you know it should be decriminalized. Uh, but I think we certainly need a lot more research to figure out how to handle that, that particular problem. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you very much for coming today and talking to us about the mental crisis, health crisis in our youth. The talk was extremely informative, relevant, and topical, and it was particularly helpful to have the practical guidance on what we need to look for, do, and be aware of. These takeaways are invaluable. Today, we have a record attendance at our luncheon, and that's in large part because of you, the importance of this topic, and the information that you imparted to us today. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to come and talk to us. Thank you to all of you for coming today, the senior manager of the school, current parents, and past parents. You are our UCC community, and we are glad to see you all here. A sincere thanks to Bonnie States and the Estates of Sunnybrook and their staff for extending such warm hospitality to us today. From UCC, a special thanks to Samantha Purgle, Courtney Neely, who I know are here, but please extend our thanks to them, and for all their assistance with the registration, and Chris Caraggio for your help in communications. We appreciate uh, sincerely your invaluable input and advice. Once again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We hope to see you next year at next year's luncheon. Enjoy.